Hi, welcome to Global Conversations Round 5. My name is Liza Eintema. I'm the president and the founder of Dance Data Project. I am here today with my colleague and research lead, Michaela Kelly, who is a dancer in the Boston area. Also, Sharon Heisinger and Kelly Palmer. So, Michaela, take it away, please. Uh, sure. So, first, I can just introduce our guests today. Thank you both for joining. We have Sharon Heisinga here, who is head of the MFA Lighting Program at University of Cincinnati's College Conservatory of Music, commonly referred to as CCM. And we are also joined by Kelly Palmer, who is the resident scenic artist at National Ballet of Canada. Thank you both for joining. Welcome, ladies. Hi there. <laughs> uh, so to kick us off, would you both share a little bit about your background and how you found yourselves where you are today? First of all, thanks for having me here. This is a pleasure and it's always great to show scenic art within the theater process. Um, I graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design in 1999, 1998. Um, and I had a degree, I have a degree of uh, fine arts. Um, after art school, it was okay, what am I gonna do next? What are the things I like to do? And I love painting. So I decided to first uh, encounter the film industry um, because Toronto has a big uh, and vibrant film industry. So I got a job as a scenic artist, uh, a permit and started there. Realized that maybe the film industry wasn't for me because of my fine arts background and had some people say, hey, you should look into theater. Went to uh, some theater companies, found out that there was a props and paint union starting. So I applied there. And from the first day on working in theater, I knew that's where I wanted to be. And ironically enough, my first uh, apprentice job was at the National Ballet. And it was just the best. And I feel like I've never left. <laughs> and it's a couple decades now. So um i just fell in love with scenic art that way so it's kind of short and sweet but that's it <laughs> i don't know part of what i'd love to ask you about as a painter is you're you when you're painting you're working in two-dimensional but scenic arts in some way is much more three-dimensional right oh yeah and how does that change things and do you like do something and then run to the back of the theater and run up to the second balcony and look at it and then come back down again well, actually, you don't. We don't paint in the theater. We actually we paint everything in a workshop. We have a huge warehouse we work on, work in, and everything's done in pieces. It's like a big puzzle piece we, we, we're creating uh, that's been given to a design given to us from a designer, and uh, you work, you know, like the big backdrops. You're standing on them, and you're painting, and you're working with your small maquette. And you do stand back then and look at it, but ultimately you're waiting for, you know, show starts a week before they hang the, the set and then that's your chance to see it. And you just hope for the best that you've used your skills wisely and uh, go from there. It's a, a fly by the seat of your pants kind of process, but it is fun. It's very fun. That would freak me out. It is freaky, but I've grown to love it. <laughs> <laughs> You're braver than I am. And I would assume that the lighting can make or break what you do. Oh, the lighting is so important. There's so many factors in theater. You become one organism at the end. But I'll tell you, I have to always remind myself that I'm when I'm painting my work in the shop, I have my daylight fluorescence. I have everything in vision. I'm critiquing the smallest points. But when it goes to stage, I know there's going to be lights and this whole atmosphere created for the for the work and it's actually my favorite part when they come together really when the lighting and the work come together you get like this whole world then comes to life really which nice. sounds amazing when things go well which i'm hoping they always do yeah no they do it's it's really fun Karen, hop in here because because this is your end of the magic yeah, sure. I'll start with um, answering Michaela's question. Uh, Kelly, you're making me deeply nostalgic. <laughs> Way back, I started as an actor and went to Interlochen Arts Academy. But while there, I realized that it um, it was 
it was not really my passion. It was something I kind of enjoyed doing, which is nowhere near enough passion to pursue that as a career. And I started being involved in costume design there. But when I went to university, uh, first at McGill University and then finished at University of Wyoming, I was there for set design and scenic painting. Okay. Um, so I've spent, um, my mentor at University of Wyoming used to paint drops for Colorado Ballet. So I have this deep affection for being very solitary, on your own in a meditative state, standing yeah. on a giant drop with a little thing right here, big um, paintbrushes on sticks and, and creating something that you can't quite see until it's hung. Um, I then moved to Vancouver and went to graduate school at University of British Columbia, initially as a scenic designer and started doing more and more lighting because it was something that kept drawing me. And every time I saw people pushing around road cases and all this lighting equipment. I was really drawn to that equipment end of it. And for quite a while, I was trying to have a dual career in lighting design and scenic painting. And for me, those two um, mental spaces eventually were incompatible because I felt the scenic painting aspect for myself was a lot of overnights and a lot of like extremely almost feminine qualities and solitary and meditative. And the experience that I was having on the lighting end was loud and raucous and mostly men and lots of gear and metal and trucks and stuff like that. So at a certain point after graduate school, I focused on lighting, but I, I still have this nostalgia for scenic painting. And what happened out of graduate school is that I had only known theater, dance, and opera in terms of the lighting world. And suddenly I started working for Christy Lights Vancouver, which is a lighting rental company. And they do a lot of touring, a lot of concert touring. And they were putting me on shows that were corporate events at the Hotel Vancouver and things that I'd never really considered before as a possibility in lighting. And then they sent me on the road. Uh, I think my first tour was with Dido and Travis was the opening act, British pop stars. And it was so, I was so astonished. Like I'd landed on a foreign planet inhabited by this alien species. Um, and it was, it was deeply attractive. I ended up touring for years and years. It was through Christy Lights that I got involved with Diana Kroll, who I had the deep pleasure of working for, for many, many years. Uh, also that was led to Nora Jones that led to a whole bunch of connections that led very interesting places in my life. And I always appreciated that early introduction to corporate and concert work, in addition to the theater, dance and opera foundations that I had, because one of the things that we'll get into later that I, I pass on to students as well, is that those aren't so different that all of these different ways of working, we're using the same visual language. When I'm talking about lighting, where I'm translating some emotional quality into a visual medium. And whether that's a corporate event or a concert event or an opera or a ballet or contemporary dance, you're, it's a similar reality. And some things are different, of course, but to me, the lighting industry as a whole is this wonderful, fascinating playground and I'll say that I really consider lighting has been a passport. It's allowed me to sit in front of the Royal family of Indonesia. It's allowed me to work in the Netherlands for the Dutch national ballet, it allowed me to be at president Obama's first inauguration. These are not places that I would normally have access to. And so I'm, uh, this is something that comes up again and again as a theme for me is just, wow, lighting is this incredible passport. I love hearing how you see so many parallels between different art forms and it's inspiring. Um, yeah, I really, like there are differences. Don't get me wrong. There's differences in work culture and what's the language? What are the expectations? What's the timeline? What's the pay? Certainly. I used to kind of joke that I would pay for my theater habit by concert touring, but ultimately what you're doing is the same thing bringing together a whole bunch of people to collaboratively, collaboratively create something beautiful. And my medium is light. Kelly's medium is paint. You know, there's a variety of different mediums there, but what I, I, I don't know, does that resonate to you, Kelly, that we're uh, really yeah, like, it's... Hey, I'll bring my medium, you bring yours and let's um, discover what this thing looks like visually. 
Uh, yeah, that's actually my favorite part. It's, um, it's yeah, my pastime, I paint. I'm, I'm a fine artist, but the, the, that's exciting in its own right. But when I come and I work with a, a theater group, it, the, you have months where you're working on a project, but it, I can't tell you, I, it's almost like I'm getting ready to perform on stage, but I'm not there for the show. But you know, you have the week. You're fixing everything up. You're you actually are then you're seeing the lighting designers. You're seeing the choreographers. The dancers are getting ready, and you think, "Wow, I'm actually a cog in this big organism." And and when it comes together, it's like a great rush, and it's it's actually quite exciting. It's it's it. That's why I think I was driven more to uh, live production than working in film because. It's people based. It's not just the medium. It's actually a lot. A lot has to do with the people in the moment. And I think that that's the beauty of it, that you're feeding off each other's vibes. It's really, really great time. I completely concur with you. And I dabbled a little in, in film as one does coming up in the industry in Vancouver and I had the same reaction. I was like, oh, that's that's the magic is happening somewhere else. Yeah. Maybe the magic is happening in an editing room, but I'm not there for that. Mm -hmm. And and to have this end, you can fix things. And part of me rebels against that a little. I'm like yeah. when it's live, you can't. It's just no, it's, it's unfolding right now. And th this is the only moment this is happening. And I, I really appreciate that about live events. Definitely. Although there's an element of danger right there, right? Yeah. Things can go very, very right or not. That's exciting. <laughs> and and Kelly, I assume you, I mean, you're talking about it's a it's more than a collaboration you become one organism at the end so it, yeah it does feel like that um like every production i have that final call to do those little bit of tweaking um i get notes um good or bad but regardless it's not never bad it's just this is it we have this chance let's just get this little um little extra sparkle i guess I would, um, I want to use a, a metaphor about getting ready for sleep. You can't make yourself go to sleep. All you can do is turn out the lights, put on clothing that's comfortable, um, you know, turn off the screens, do, do a whole series of steps that create an atmosphere conducive to sleep. Same with meditation. And I feel like shows are the same. I'm like, the thing I can do is be involved with 100% commitment, like I'm going to inhabit this thing completely. And then we'll just see uh, what happens. And I don't know about you, Kelly, but I certainly had experiences where I have no idea if this thing is good or, or maybe terrible. And, but I'm completely committed. And then I'll lift my head up opening night and go, uh Oh, I wish I hadn't invited 30 people or wow, this really is great. Um, this is accepting those handful of experiences we'll really all know in the moment that it's magical. But that I, I've always found that a bit curious that it's possible to not totally know if this is a great show or not till opening because it's still happening. It's still being created. And everybody has to be in there with 100% commitment. Otherwise, um, the, the chance is lost for it to be incredible. Does that resonate with you, Kelly? Uh, yeah, it definitely resonates for me. Um, so, like uh, each show, each production um, that um, every design that comes to to me, our, our shop, um, it's never the same. So there, there's everything I learned from the shows previous. There's always going to be a new surprise. I'm there's no paint technique. You'll kind of bring what you've known and learn something new for the next show it's like every show is like a snowflake you know it's a snowflake but it's not going to look like the other and those techniques that make it come together uh they're all unknowns and so you just have to accept on your experience and free your mind <laughs> and uh, roll with it and accept the uncertainty that is that is so wonderful because then you might have those tools for another time. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> we do. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, we have we keep everything here. So I have tools that um, we've made from, and other people have made from generations before me that we keep, and and sponges we've carved or 
techniques that somebody learns on another show, it's all written down. And I have actually a file cabinet of techniques and colors and, and just think because it's just uh, ever growing knowledge. It's always in flux. Um, maybe on the opposite side, have you either of you ever experienced any like disasters during a performance or a project? Um, and how did you navigate that? I mean, there's there's lots of exciting challenges that we could frame with the word disaster if we wanted to. Um, but the, the one that really stands out in my mind, the time that I've probably felt the most powerless in a live situation was in Russia, in uh, I think Nizhny Novgorod or, or Novosibirsk, both cities I had not been aware of before, but I was working for, the, for a band and we had a promoter who loved Russia. So she would book many Russian concerts. And traveling into those areas, I would usually, I would have a translator, but the translator is not necessarily someone who knows anything about theater. So maybe they speak both languages, but if I'm going to use technical language or language that's specific to lighting that we've decided we use in English, it does the direct translation doesn't necessarily mean anything of if you just translate those words. Um, so we had, I had like a Kundalini yoga teacher who was the translator and she was all in white and uh, sandals, which is kind of a no-no on stage and a turban and then a really grumpy chain smoking Russian stagehand. And first thing in the morning, I was like, oh no, <laughs> this is, you, you probably don't mix normally in your own culture. I'm guessing and perhaps this is going to be a difficult day. And there, from the moment we started, there were problems. They had not realized that they needed to bring the color filters for the lights, gels. They thought we were bringing them. We didn't have anything with us. So then we had to go and dig through the building's inventory and try to find these really old, odd colors. And it ended up not looking at all how I thought it should look. And then then there was something that was going wrong with the dimmer packs, which had the effect on stage of like intermittent strobe lights. Mm -hmm. And keeping this is during very, very, very meditative music and just like flashing strobe lights and not in time, just completely random. And the only light that stayed on consistently was on the drummer who had specifically asked, hey, can you keep me darker than everyone else? I'm feeling a little insecure on stage these days. And there was no light on all the main singers. And there was, that just happened for the whole two hours. And there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. So that was probably the biggest, um, like stress, sweat, disaster, nothing can be done in this moment. There is no other option in the building. Disaster. That was pretty bad. <laughs> but weirdly, the audience didn't care at all. They were they were just delighted to be in that environment. So uh, again, I think disasters are very uh, through our own lenses, right? Like Michaela, if you're on stage and something is disastrous for you, I might notice as the lighting designer, but it, it wasn't the over, it wasn't the story of the evening for me. The story of the evening for me is about lighting. So thank goodness. Thank goodness. I used to have a teacher who would say, it's just ballet, nobody dies. Um, mm -hmm. So try to remind us like <laughs> what feels yeah. so important in the moment is not going to be a life or death situation. All right, Kelly, your best, worst disaster. Well, fortunately for me, I, I can say there's never been a disaster because by the time it gets to stage, <laughs> we've corrected them. <laughs> no, um, I, I've never looked at anything as a disaster. There's moments of stress. Uh, there can be accidents like um, somebody's dumped a bucket of paint. Uh, somebody painted the wrong color. Um, there's been episodes, I'm not going to name specific things <laughs> to give it away, but sometimes something's painted backwards, like you've tra something's been transferred, but you can, you can balance your time and correct things, but it's, it's more like disasters. It's more like a layer and we treat them as layers. So any kind of 
thing that might be done wrong, we use it as a chance to maybe invent something new. So if there's a piece of fabric that doesn't match, we start, we try and balance or tweak elsewhere or um, the disasters and the stress, it's, it's put aside. So we just take each day at a time. And, and it's true when it goes to stage, the audience doesn't, they're not focusing on maybe a crack that's in the scenery, um, a piece of scenery that might be ill painted or something buckled, uh, just something went wrong because the audience doesn't care. They're looking at the whole production and I hope they're actually focusing on the dancers, which they are. So disasters, no, there hasn't been a disaster, but just a chance to maybe um, learn from your mistake, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, one question that we were thinking about is, Sharon, if you could talk to us about um, your transition to teaching and how being a professor has affected your work as a lighting designer and like what joys it has given you. I had not, even though I went through theater education programs, I somehow was, I, I got started touring right away and just went for it. And it was really surprising to me to discover um, in my late thirties, oh yeah, academia is a whole part of lighting design too. And what had happened is I, I just became interested in, I didn't finish my MFA first time I went. I started getting work and I just left. I was like, see y'all later, I'm gonna do this. This is more interesting. And then um, 12 years later, I decided that thing bothers me. It's unfinished. I'd like to go back and finish it. And I went back to University of British Columbia, Department of Theater, Dance and Creative Writing, and they were wonderful. They were, said, yes, we'd love to help you finish this thing. And really were great about helping me structure a program around my professional commitments and, and finish that and do the whole thesis and defend it and all the rest of it. And I spoke with my alma mater at University of Wyoming and they said, oh, we have a, we, are you interested in a teaching position? Our lighting person just left. Would you like to come and join us? So I was at the University of Wyoming for four years. And then in the Netherlands, I was teaching at the Academy for Theater and Dance as a guest lecturer, teaching like one class a year. And then now at CCM. So there's been this varied um, interaction with arts education, specifically in lighting design. And the thing that, one of the things that really stands out to me is that when I started in the business, I really was only, always the only woman, especially in the concert and corporate world. Theater, different ball game. But in the, in the, especially touring for musicians, maybe there'd be another woman, but that's gonna be the singer, right? But in terms of the crew, I was always the only woman. And that equation is really different now. I would say that a third of my students are women and it is something that's on their mind, but not in the same way of, I don't know if I can do this kind of thing. And they're encountering a world that certainly there is more work to be done, but they're not encountering an industry that's saying, are you sure you can do this? I've never seen a woman do this before. So that's really, really inspiring. And I also am blown away by the ability that my students have to absorb technology. Like they've grown up soaked in it. And, you know, we, we all have encountered it and lighting is very technologically driven. Uh, if you blink for two years, you're probably out of date. And what I'm seeing now and what I'm feeling myself like feeling my way into at CCM is, I think actually I'm a curator of information now. There's no way I can be the source of all the information that I think these students should be exposed to because it's massive. I'm so glad I brought you together, not just the, the Canadian stuff, which is super cool, but also uh, you're, you said lighting is very technology driven, but I'm listening to Kelly and I'm fascinated. I wanna go into that file cabinet of hers and scrounge around all those wonderful old techniques and tools and everything else that if you remember they're there, you can pull them out, right, Kelly? Uh, absolutely, it's, 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 it's weird because I 
do to student tours here and they come in they're looking at everything and occasionally we'll get new permits to come in if we're doing a big production and my hard tough thing is we got these young younger people coming in and it's working with their hand they haven't done it as much they have that knowledge and that you know if they really care about it they've done the research they know the productions they know you know they've read about the process but it's that um, tactile quality of uh, moving around and understanding materials that is a little bit different in the last while for me um, with newer people who I might be hiring to come into the shop and whatnot um, but the, the one thing we do have here is we keep all our sets, we keep all our information. Um, it's actually, uh, we store all our sets here. So it's a muse, it's like the back of our shop is the Google. It's the, the research, the ideas, the, the stored information and, and things like that. So um, it's a different process, but <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit since you're keeping all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. About materials and how they interact together and do they flake, do they dry, do they dull? What do you do about that? Conservation must be huge and quite expensive. Um, it's uh, it, so I'll, I'm always working on a new production. There's always something going on that's new, but we also replay. So we'll play, um, say we are playing uh, next year sleeping beauty it's a very it's decades old set decades and uh, some of the sets i'm repairing are older than me so we bring them out yes they're degrading uh, um falling apart um but i'll lay them out we bring out the set pieces um and we repair them we try and bring them back to hopefully as strong as they were when they first played but in that process, I'm learning about the technique then, uh, which I can incorporate into the future. Um, but we take so much care. And that's why I actually really admire the National Ballet because we have designs that we still play and the designers are not with us anymore. And you get to bring forth th these actual pieces and relive them. And it's a really beautiful process, very caring um, um, thing we do. So I'll have a brand new, um, more technical uh, piece I'm working on, but I'll have a 45 year old backdrop on the ground and I'm stitching, sewing, um, making paint to match and recreate what was and also to um, not hide the age of the pieces but to celebrate that we still use and and put them in our performances um, it's really actually quite a great so there's something really lovely about working both with you know the older and then creating as well mm -hmm. you know it's a fascinating process and and um i think they have to go hand in hand because to erase the the past is to not learn about the future and the techniques uh, I have and I consistently am repairing and working on it's um, it's an invaluable um, experience. Uh, it's history. It's important. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, it sounds like a lot of your work is very hands on and physical. How did you manage during the um, early onset of the pandemic and how oh. did you affect your work? Well, it, it, it was difficult. Um, we were in the midst of a massive, our biggest, one of our biggest productions, mm -hmm. and we had to shut down. Um, the day we were shut down, it was, I actually felt dizzy in the shop because there was so much stress and anxiety and excitement. Uh, we knew we had a couple months go, to go till, you know, the show goes on. And then all of a sudden, everyone had to go home. So we had a, we literally um, dropped our tools on the ground. I sealed up the paint and went home. And it what we literally basically we were basically shut down for the rest of the year. And then we gradually started back, but due to circumstance, we would be shut down. Um, it was a really sad, um, really scary, abstract time 
it's I don't have all the words for it because I'm still adjusting to it because now I've come back to work um, just recently and I'm picking the tools off the ground. I'm trying to get myself in the headspace. I have things in mid paint, half painted, and I have to just get back into there and keep going. And then now we're going to do the production next year. So, you know, we're talking four years <laughs> for something that should have been a year's process. So it's very weird. It was really hard. It is still hard. Yeah. When is the first uh, live production for National Ballet? Uh, well, right now, um, the way they're releasing restrictions and the way things are going, I think um, they're going to do some outdoor um, productions down a place called Harbor Front in Toronto, and they're going to do some outdoor live stage with minimal audience, um, which is very exciting and, you know, a really kind of new cool thing that they're doing. And to be indoors on stage, we're very hopeful that in November, when we usually do um, our fall, fall season, uh, we'll have uh, a short program going. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sharon, how did you manage during the onset of the pandemic and the height of quarantine? We pivoted quite strongly to uh, video, to media, like content projection design. None of us are sure exactly what to call all of this, but all the content for theater, dance and opera, but also concerts. And there's a very interesting area of this industry, of the entertainment industry, very broadly speaking, to include all of this, where lighting and and video, like the content that we want to see on stage, and cameras and video games are all kind of coming into a this mushy mix. So I had been very lucky and our dean was really supportive. I had put in a proposal for acquisition of a whole bunch of media equipment, various projectors and media servers and software and hardware. So when the pandemic came, I was talking to my student body saying, hey, as far as I'm concerned, all of this projection, video, et cetera, is um, adjacent to lighting, if not a complete overlap. And we're going to focus on that this year. And we did a lot of that. So some things were possible and theoretical. Let's talk about script analysis and let's talk about process and interaction with directors and choreographers. And then some of it was great. Practically, we can learn how to do 2D and 3D animation. You can learn how to program these media servers. You can start digging into things like Unreal Engine and other gaming engines and find out what is going on in there. And I, I mean, I have one student who's now working full time for XR Studios in LA and two who are interning. And, you know, these kinds of companies who are behind some of these major concerts, Billie Eilish and Katy Perry and things like the MTV Video Music Awards, where a lot of that is extended reality. A lot of what you're seeing is content created by someone on a surround LED screen. And that's what's being shot. They're not actually up on a 700 foot tall building and it is dystopian reality. Um, so that was a lot of what we did practically, right? And I think that it was, it was really rewarding for everyone. And of course, we're so excited to get back to that feeling of a lot of live people in a room and what that brings. But I think we did a really good job of navigating what was possible. We also uh, started leaning on alumni and guest artists quite heavily because people had lots of time and all of us were pretty freaked out. And it was great to be able to call someone who normally was probably too busy and say, do you want to come talk to my students for like six hours and talk about your process and things you've done? And it was wonderful for us, of course. And also, I think it was beneficial for the people to be able to like, oh, OK, I can ground myself back into, um, you know, this identity as an artist and talk about creation and talk about the art and talk about past shows to a really interested population. So those were those were a bunch of things we did. I won't pre pretend that I wasn't freaked out myself, but the 
the bulk of my anxiety just got transferred onto, wow, I, I really want to get these 40 lighting design and technology students through this year in the most beneficial way possible. Before we kind of wrap up, are there any projects that the two of you are working on that you're excited to share with us? Um, things we can look out for in the future? Well, the project that I'm excited about is the one that we were working on before we were shut down. It's uh, Swan Lake. Uh, it's for Karen Kane's uh, retirement, and she's been with the company now 51 years. And so uh, very happy to put forward and finish this uh, show, which will be next June, if everything works out well with the, the world. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. Um, I think there's been a lot of heart and emotion uh, put into it. And for myself, because the first show I ever worked on um, for the National Ballet as an apprentice was Swan Lake um, 21 years ago. And at that point I was painting the back of the, the, the set because that was my apprentice job. And now, you know, I'm in the position I am. It's very exciting. I've got to see something full circle plus. And uh, the company um, in the last year has been so supportive so sensitive and emotional uh, and helpful to everyone's needs. And I think, I think it will be a great celebration to finish this and, and show that we can survive any kind of con consequence and the show will go on. So that's something I'm looking forward to. So that's June of 2020. 2022, yeah, yeah. What are you excited about, Sharon? A few things. Um, one is I'm working on a textbook with Alan Branton, who's a very well-known lighting designer for large scale live broadcast events. Um, and we're really interested in helping students break down what is the design process for things that are like a multi-act awards show, like a Super Bowl halftime show. What would you do if you were hired to design lighting for that? Where would you start? What's step one? So that's that's quite an exciting project. He's had a, a really impressive and career and is interested in some of the things I'm interested in is the intersection of uh, psychology, spirituality, and art. And there's, to me, there's a ton of overlap in those three things. They might be three different words for the same thing. And Alan's really interested in that as well. So there's a lot of that kind of exploration in that textbook. And I'd also love to mention a dear friend, Laura Frank, who has started an organization called Framework, which is really focused on um, all this digital content screens across all industries, so theater, dance, all, across everything in the entertainment industry. So I'm more and more involved with that um, as well, helping to create a, a new talent platform where between um, her, who she has created Framework, and myself and some other professors were saying, can we put our students forward on a platform that's really interesting to prospective employers and just help bridge that walking out of university, what happens? What is that first job? What is that career trajectory? So those are uh, really, really exciting initiatives. Uh, was there anything else that we didn't touch on that either of you wanted to mention? There was one question that I was looking forward to about uh, positives that came out of the pandemic experience. Uh, hmm. Would you mind if I- Please do. No, 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 absolutely. Although it, you sounded pretty really positive anyway. <laughs> that, um, so one of the things that I really almost miss about the pandemic, and I'm speaking from a place of great privilege with a job through all of that, and I just want to acknowledge that, but there was a feeling of universal vulnerability from people that I had not encountered before on such a large scale. And I found myself suddenly having conversations with other artists that people suddenly had two hours to talk instead of 15 minutes to talk. And the conversation would go quite deep quite quickly because all of us were already in a fairly deep place of, wow, lots of questioning, lots of um, 
maybe being confronted by being by yourself for the first time, th those kinds of experiences. So there was a real quality of openness that then led to really interesting conversations with people that I was focusing on, like CCM alumni from our own program and other guest artists. And I hope that we can keep that sense of openness, vulnerability, um, connectedness, a sort of feeling of shared experience that, oh, oh, right, yeah, I always knew we were in it together, but wow, we're really in it together. Um, and I found those experiences to be incredibly valuable. And I think students did too, as well as conversations about, hey, are there things we want to change about this industry? Uh, we've, we've been going on autopilot uh, because the show must go on and it's always a crisis. So what would we like to change? And are there scheduling things we want to change? And lots of conversations around getting rid of unpaid internships, which I think would be an incredible Amen. step. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We don't do them. You're, yeah. we're, we're, DDP is 100% aligned. I keep telling mm -hmm. you, do not work for free. Do not work for free. Yeah. And in terms of equity, there is a huge first step right there. So um, that's that's like a whole package of stuff that I thought, wow, that was uh, really valuable learnings and experiences that came out of the pandemic. I, I, I definitely agree with you there. The, those those uh, sensitive conversations and uh, being able to connect more was actually, I find, very beneficial. I, 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 m my thoughts on the positive is that slowing down and recognizing those seconds that maybe you would lose in your day and to take a step back and, and, and uh, maybe take a look at the process and to, there, we have a lot of time to think, how can we benefit with maybe adjusting how we do things? How, how can we take care of um, time and space and, and, and each person's health and that, uh, being aware of each other's emotions and times of stress, it's actually, um, those are valuable pluses, especially in, in, our, in an arts industry. I, I think that that sensitivity is important with time and stuff. Thank you both so much for meeting with us and sharing your insights and experiences. Uh, it was really a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for creating this space. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, shout out to Victoria Morgan, who, uh, who introduced me to you.